each day with you. Lead me, oh Lord, lead me. Lead me, guide me along the way. For if you lead me, I cannot stay. Lord, let me walk each day. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to Worship with Aldersgate. It's so good to see you here in the room and joining in online and tuning in later after the fact because you did something else this morning. We're glad to have you too. Uh, we are assembling through the power of the Holy Spirit together, no matter where and when we are. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the morning, but first I want to ask you a question. What, how do you know that something is valuable? Why don't you toss out a couple answers here real quick. How do you know something's valuable? What lets you know that? Sammy? Um, yeah. I have it on my hand. Aw, <laughs> that was a very good answer. Did you see that? The <laughs> wedding ring. Yeah. Okay. How hard you look How for hard it. How hard you look for it, right? What yeah. other people say that it's worth, right? Yeah. How hard you hold on to it. The exact Albert's wedding band, too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love these people. What you oh, can yeah. get in exchange for. A world for of hurt. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, best decision ever. Um, how do you know something is valuable? That's what we're going to be thinking about this morning. Um, what we're going to do is have a brief prayer and a quick time with the kids. Uh, they may run along after that if they like. And then we have an ensemble music piece. We're still doing remote music at the church. You know, I thought, hey, Daniel is going to be coming back. I think the first Sunday of September, Daniel's going to be in the room with us again. Everybody say, yay! <laughs> and I thought, oh, good, now we can do music all together. And then, like, Delta. Thanks, Delta. Stupid COVID. We'll see what we're going to do. But Daniel will be here in the room soon. Anyway, ensemble music done by the remote uh, musicians this morning. Scripture lesson by John Wise in the house today. And a message after that, we will have a time of offering and announcements, celebration and thanks, and then at the very end, a pastoral prayer. We do it at the end so that you have the whole service to type in your prayer requests. We'll get those right at the end, and we can create a prayer of the people. So I'd encourage people in the room, if you've got your phones, if you're one of those smartphone people, someone's phone just rang. Mm -hmm. George has his phone. <laughs> um, go ahead and open up Facebook. Say hello to the people joining us online so that they know that we notice them, that they're a part of us. Good Thank job, you. Albert. Albert's already on it. Say good morning to the people who are joining us so they know that we see them and that they're important to us. And if you're online, uh, give us an emoji or a comment so that we know that you are here. Hey, look, we got Ryan. Hey, Ryan. All right, fantastic. Ryan who? Ryan Crow. Hey, Ryan, what's up? All right, so let's start with a prayer. Lord God, we are glad to be together this morning wherever we are and whenever we are. In this room and in this place, God, I'm thankful for fans on a hot and sticky summer day. God, wherever we are and whatever the weather is, bless us, connect us, refresh us, God. Use this time to build us up as people who seek after you, who want to follow you, who want to share your love with the world. 
God, we ask your blessing over this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, are we Instagramming the children's moment? I think we should do the sermon. Okay. We might as well decide yeah. on air if that works. Okay. We could ask both of our viewers what they prefer. <laughs> I know. We're building our Instagram following. That's right. Yes, that's right. Slowly but surely. Uh, all right. So I brought, uh, I like to bring props for the children's sermon because I think it helps us see things. Um, I've got here a Lucy's water bottle. One of many water bottles that Lucy has. This is the type that, by the way, does not go in the dishwasher. Or at least not the bottom rack That's <laughs> the right. dishwasher. Found that out the hard way with the other one. I have another water bottle. This one says NRHS class of 2020. Yeah, that's pretty. That's Lucy's also. Lucy, you got lots of water bottles. Yeah, she got that this summer. Another water bottle. Do you like this kind with the screw-on cap? Um, I do, but that one's not also not dishwasher safe. Oh, man, like, we need a dishwasher safe. I don't have time to, like, hand wash and dry clean everything, you know. Yeah. Like, <laughs> no, no delicates for no. wash. One more water bottle. Also, Lucy's. Yours were all on the front. I like this one because it has this cool button on it right here, and it goes bloop. Did you see that pop open? Is that kind of fun? Let's do it again. Bloop. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one because it doesn't spill all down your front if you're driving. Like this one will spill all, all over your face. Well, in this one, the mouth part stays clean. Yes. You can close it back up so if it falls, it does. One more time just for fun. There we go. That's so fun. Water bottles. You brought your own water bottle this morning. Yes. How important are water bottles during the summer? As somebody just held up theirs in the back of the room. Sarah's got her. So important. When we were in Maine a couple weeks ago, one of the most important things we could bring to the work sites we went to when we were working on houses was our water bottle. When you go to school or if you, wherever you go, in your snack, you bring a water bottle, right? Yeah. So my car is full of water bottles because every time I think to leave the house, I think, do I have my water bottle? Well, and our son uses the car and he gets free water at work in the break room and then leaves the bottles. That's right. It's like a, a recycling truck of water bottles now in the back. So important. We know that it's important to drink water to stay hydrated on a hot day. We know that it refreshes us, that it makes us feel better when we drink water. And we know when we forget our water, we are grumpy and unhappy. Do you know one of the things that Jesus compared himself to? I bet you can guess because of what I've been talking about. Water, right? Jesus says, a relationship with me is like water. It's essential, it's so important to you, it's so refreshing, it's so fundamental to living your day well. And I thought, yeah, it is. And it's funny, because sometimes we forget about that, we for maybe forget about Jesus or forget about God, but then all of a sudden we don't feel as good and we're kind of grumpy and we're wearing down. And we say, what is it? I got my real water bottle, what is it? Maybe it's because we didn't spend time with God that day. We didn't talk to God and tell God what was on our mind. I think that's it too. Yeah. So Jesus said that he is like water of life to us and that he's as essential and as valuable as water is to us. So wherever you are, go get a drink of water. Now I'm thirsty and I only have my coffee cup. This is no good, can I have some of yours? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll do that in a minute. The last time I drank out of that one, it spilled on my dress, so I'm not going to do it. I like the flippy one better. Yeah. Well, you can, uh, whatever. All right. Yeah. So let's remember that about Jesus, as essential, refreshing as water. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the gift of water. We know that we are made from water, God. Thank you for the gift of Jesus in our lives of faith, because God, we know that we are also made for faith. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, Daniel, I am excited to hear this ensemble piece. I sent in an audio track, and I haven't heard it yet. So um, we have a flautist, Gigi, who is joining us remotely as well. All right, take it away. Let us pray. Together on our knees Let us break bread together
comes from uh, the book of Genesis, chapter 21, verses 14 through 20. Hey, John Wise is our liturgist this morning. I'm so glad you're here. you got to turn on your camera, buddy, so people oh, outside the room can I see I thought you. it was on. There we go. Oh, there we are. Now do you have the scripture lesson, though? Oh, but it turns it off. Oh. So here, we'll grab, we'll grab <laughs> the other <laughs> one. What? This is very high tech. You can't use your phone for the scripture uh-huh. lesson if, and do them at the same time. If only you could print up every that's, scripture that's lesson and find I thought I could, uh... <laughs> oh, it's not here, here. Give this to John. Give it to John. Give that to oh. John. Is that written out there? There we go. <laughs> All right. Okay. Modern technology. All right, take it away, John. Okay, here we go. All yours, buddy. <laughs> All right. So today's scripture lesson comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 21, verses 14 through 20. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, John. Good morning, Instagram. Good morning, everyone. If you're just joining us, we're so glad to have you here. Um, we are together through the Holy Spirit in the room here in North Reading, and also across the internet uh, now and later on. Welcome. Uh, we. Let's see. I just had something in my mind and it went boop, boop, right away. That's oh, that's fine. Yes. So John just read to us the story from uh, Genesis 21 about Hagar, the moment when Hagar uh, was in despair. And I wanted to place that because this whole summer we've been going through Abraham's journeys. This uh, summer seemed like a great summer for road trips. At least it did in the beginning. Seemed like a great summer for traveling and getting out there, right? I'm going to say it again. Thanks, Delta. Thanks, Delta. Yeah. Um, But we thought, well, with this travel theme, let's follow Abram. There's a huge section of the book of Genesis that covers Abram from Genesis 12 to 25, and we thought, let's travel along with him and see what we get from his journey. 
So a couple of weeks ago, I left off at Genesis chapter 16, and I sat down to read going on 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. And guess what we're not going to talk about? We're not going to talk about a number of the chapters in that section, again, 17, 18, 19, especially because it is for mature audiences only. Uh, I thought, do we want to take this up? We have rape. We have uh, all sorts of rape. Uh, we have incest. We have destruction of cities by fire. And I thought, yeah, it's, it's kind of gory. I don't think this is the stuff they make ne Netflix shows out of, right? It, I think they do. They don't they do. <laughs> yeah. so, I, you, so your homework is to go home and read your Bible. <laughs> That's right. If you want to see what the scandal's about, look, especially 17, 18, and 19. But I thought, I feel like um, as much as the world is improving around us a little bit and there's so many signs of hope uh, regarding COVID, we still carry enough weight. I don't want to take on a topic that's like, bam, bam, bam. Okay? All right. So if you yeah. want to challenge, you go do it. So fun, fun fact, though, his name gets changed from Abram to Abraham. So now we can call him Abraham. That's right. That's one of the stories we could have done. Throughout this section, though, we have this character, Hagar, that is sort of woven. She pops in and out throughout this section of scripture. And she caught our interest. And we wanted to talk to you about her today because the stories of scripture being written, you know, established almost 2,000 years ago, finalized but as old as 6,000 years ago, usually are talking about men, right? Because that's the way the world has been for so long. So when you have a woman character who does things, that's one thing. If you have a named woman character, that's even more remarkable. If you have a woman who speaks to God, that puts her in the very top tier of rare women in yeah. the Bible. And Hagar speaks to God not once, but twice. She is a foreigner. So a one-down status, and she is a slave. She has no husband. Who is this woman, this exceptional, remarkable woman, who appears in the story even though she's female, foreigner, slave, unmarried? Who is this woman? What can we get? Okay, so the first time, go ahead. I was just going to say, though, when John was reading it, they, they don't name her son. They just say the boy. Well, but we know section. his name, in but in that one section, he's still not important. Yeah. It's all about her. It's astonishing yeah. and rare, unusual. Yeah. So that's why we say, what, what do we need to know about Hagar? So we meet Hagar um, because she's a slave that's been brought into Abram's family. Uh, she is a lady's maid. Anybody watch Downton Abbey? She's a lady's maid for, for his wife, Sarah. She was acquired in Egypt. Abram and Sarah had had to move to Egypt because of a famine, and they picked her up there, at least according to tradition. And so let's just sit with that for a minute. She was sold by her parents to foreigners and had to move away. All right? Sold. She was going to be under the control of somebody else. And when I think about that, I think about the times in life, maybe you have resonated with this, when you moved when you didn't mean to. <laughs> you ever have a job change that you didn't plan on? Did you ever have a house relocation that you didn't know that was going to happen and suddenly, I just found out this morning. Yeah, our neighbor down the street, she got a job in Montpelier and it's kind of a big commute. Yeah, yeah. So I think she's moving next, no, at the end of this week. Sometimes we move, right? Sometimes we didn't plan on it. And when we go to this new place, we have to learn how do you get along there? Like what do these people care about? What's valuable to them? What's important to them? How can I become friends? How can I get connected, right? Now she comes in a, in a servant's position so she knows what her job is, but she's in a foreign place. She uh, has to learn a new culture of people. So she tries to fit in, she tries to do her job. We're filling in a little background here, making yeah. some assumptions. She's with Sarah for a while, but all of a sudden, as she's been negotiating, like, how do I fit here? And, and wh what can lead me to have an okay life here? She arrives. She gets a promotion. She gets a promotion. Sarah, Abram's wife, can't have children so far. They've been trying for a really long time. And so Sarah says, after not talking to God, by the way, says, well, I haven't been able to get pregnant. My, son, my, my husband really wants a son. But I have this slave, right? She's mine. If I give my slave to Abraham, she can have my baby for me. Do yes, you like that? Surrogate. Surrogate. Yeah. Unpaid. 
Yeah. Yeah. Promotion for Hagar. Now, I mean, awkward perhaps, but now she gets pregnant immediately, right? She does her job very well. And now instead of being just this lady's maid, just this woman here in the house that does work for the, for the wife, now she is carrying her master's child. Boom. She's arrived, right? Golden ticket. There it is. Because if she bears a son to Abram, her status is going to be elevated so much. Necessarily, right? She becomes so valuable not only to Sarah, but to Abram too. Yeah. So she's feeling thrilled about this pregnancy. And I could see her starting to show a little bit, kind of walking around. She sees Sarah, her mistress. She's like, yep. look what I just did. Throwing shade. A little, little bit of baby shade, a little bit of pregnancy shade, right? Feeling, um, I don't know, maybe not quite as submissive or as subservient as she used to. But she knows that this is her thing, that her future is set after this uncertainty and upheaval that she's had in her life. And it made me think about having early success. I don't know if some of you adults in the room remember, you know, maybe you went uh, from high school into a job or you went from high school into college or into the military. And maybe at some point you thought, oh, this is it. I got it made. This is, you know, this is, this is the writing on the wall for me, right? Smooth sailing from here on out. I'm going to tell a new story. Oh, boy. Sam has not heard this story. We're doing it in public so that you can't be upset. Are you intrigued? <laughs> <laughs> well, here, before you do yours, my, my example is um, One Hit Wonders. It, if you're listening oh, yeah. to the radio and you hear a song, you're like, oh, whatever happened to that group? And you look on their Wikipedia, it's like, the best thing that ever happened was they had one great song and then nothing. That's right, yep. that's right. And then you become an answer to a yeah. trivia question. Yeah, they, they peak too early. Yeah. Who sang Walking on Sunshine? Everyone's like, I know that song. Yeah, and Katrina I, and the Waves. And oh. then they did nothing. <laughs> right. You're welcome. All right, new story. Here new we story. go. Well, no, but I remember, so one of my roommates in college junior year, um, she had made it somewhat clear in a number of conversations that she was really excited about the boyfriend that she had because he came from a really wealthy family, OK? She's like, well, he comes from a really good family, she'd mm. say, as if wealth equals good, right? But I remember being like, oh, wow, she's so lucky. She's dating this guy. And I didn't think he was really handsome, but he was a business major and, you know, seemed to have a lot of potential. His family was wealthy. And I thought, wow, that's something. And then junior year, I started dating somebody who was uh, in my same major. You know, you know him and have met him. And um, I didn't know anything about his family. But as we started dating, I realized and then especially when I went to visit him one time on a break from school, this guy came from a really wealthy family. And I remember like arriving at his house and it's like, we'll put you in, in the guest room. We like to call it the princess suite. You know, would it's you like to huge. go out to dinner? We'll drive the Volvo tonight. You know, like well, that sort like, of thing. Who's in this cul-de-sac? Oh, Carl Malone lives over there. Yeah, like, I think wait, it was what? The Utah like, Jazz? Yeah. And I had no idea because we were just in school there. But I will tell you, I remember that feeling there for a little bit. like. Oh man, this could be it, you know? Like, wouldn't this be nice? This solves a lot of questions for me, you know? Like, if this, if this is where I end up, I don't have to worry about sort of what job I'm gonna get, because he was very career-minded as well, you know? And I thought, oh, I could just relax. This is it, my ticket. You'll be glad to know I broke up with him. Yeah. Yes. He did not meet the standard, <laughs> eventually, because it turns out that's not the only important thing. But- well, it's, it's like your other friend who was, for a period of time, she was, it, her name was first name, I'm getting married, maiden name. And like, <laughs> they got the colors of the dresses, they dyed the shoes, and then they broke up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, you got stuck with a stupid dress. I ended up buying two bridesmaid, two bridesmaid yeah. dresses for this girl. Yeah. And then she broke up with me, and we're no longer friends. I know. <laughs> anyway, separate story. Hagar, though, Hagar goes from not having a place and a position to having arrived, to having her future spelled out and looks rosy and good. But it goes to her head a little bit, strutting around Sarah. Sarah has had enough. Sarah starts to beat her because she's her slave. She can do that. And it becomes so terrible, so oppressive to Hagar, she runs away. And here is where her life really starts to change. Here is the first time that she meets with God. She is out, she's a pregnant woman. She, she knew about the importance of a water bottle, I'll tell you. She went and she found 
a spring, and she's there crying because she doesn't know what to do. She can't travel far by herself, pregnant woman. And God shows up. And he says, hey, guy, who are you? And where do you come from? And where are you going? And she says, well, I'm running away. And he said, because I've been treated so badly. And God says to her, I see you. I see your pain and your discomfort and your distress. I see your situation. And I want you to go back. Right. I want you to go back to that difficult environment. I want you to do your best there, even though it's so hard for you. But I want you to know that I see you. Now keep in mind that Hagar is a foreigner. She's from Egypt. Her gods in Egypt are not the god of Abraham. This is her first experience with the god of Abraham, and it's broken right into her life, and she realizes that she is seen, that she is known, that she is a part of what God is doing in this family. Imagine what that does for her, her resolve, for her sense of purpose, for her sense of strength to endure that difficult situation. So she goes back. She goes back. Her baby Ishmael is born. Things stabilize around there. I think she's probably feeling pretty good because she has uh, had a son uh, for Abram. She knows that she's important and valuable to Abram and that family. I think she tries, tries to make nice with Sarah, you know, and she can just sit back and, and not have to worry about gloating or anything. And things are stable for about 10 years, a little more than 10 years. But then Sarah finally gets pregnant. Isaac is born, a younger brother for Ishmael. And all of a sudden, Hagar moves from having her one thing that gives her all this legitimacy and power and importance in that world. It's now a little bit more tenuous, right? It destabilizes. What's going to happen? Like, obviously, Isaac is born to Sarah, the wife, but maybe there's a place for Ishmael. You know, maybe if, if, if Hagar's in good behavior, maybe if um, the boys are friends, that could work. She encourages them to be friends, even though they're far apart in age, kind of like Calvin and Wesley. So, uh, oh, sorry. But they're friends. Just making sure you're paying attention. Yeah. Maybe it'll work. Maybe there's still a place for her. Maybe she still fits, even though a child was born to Sarah. Sarah looks out, and she sees Ishmael and Isaac playing together, and she does not like it one nope. bit. Nope. She's kind of fierce, and it's like, all right, Abraham, you got to get rid of her. Get rid of her. I don't even want this kid to have a dime of the inheritance. I know he's your son, but my son is the one that's important because I'm the wife. Abraham's a little troubled by it, but he's like, well, she's, you know, okay, she's your slave, do what, you, do what you want. And Sarah puts a little bit of a fine point on it. She said, I don't want it to be unclear about what's going on. I don't want to be the bad guy. Abram, you send her away. Can you imagine the scene where Abram says to Hagar and her son, his boy, Ishmael, you're going to need to go. My wife is unhappy. I have a son. You need to leave. He fills up a water bottle for them. They were made out of leather at that time. A water bottle. He puts it on Hagar's back, and he sends them away. This was her ticket. This was her connection. This was the thing that gave her security, right? Gave her status. This was it for her. And it, Sarah wasn't the one. She couldn't blame Sarah. Abram did it himself. Send her away. And she goes away. She's absolutely crushed, devastated. Everything that she had worked for, the whole thing that she had tried to set up and, and keep secure and keep balanced and keep level. She had been on her good behavior around Sarah, who could be a brat. All of it is gone. She is so discouraged. She is so bereft that even though she's sent away, she, she doesn't form a plan. She's not like, well, okay, next son, we're going to go, you know, do this thing. She doesn't have anything. She wanders. Scripture uses that word. She wanders. So even with the little energy and the little water she has, she has no focus to use it well. She wanders. And when the water runs out, she knows that they will die. She wasn't fortunate to find a spring like she did last time. She knows that they're going to die there in the desert. And just as a mother, this to me is unimaginable. She says, son, I'm going to leave you over here. 
you stay under this bush and I'm leaving you too. When she goes away, as with John, the scripture said, as far as an arrow can go, I guess that's far enough, right? Out of earshot? Because she doesn't want to hear him cry. Imagine the level of um, despair and depression this woman has that she would rather not hear her child cry. But then God shows up the second time. Because God hears the child cry. Hagar's crying too. God hears the child first. I don't know, maybe yeah. louder. But God hears. God saw Hagar the first time. Now God hears Hagar and her son. And he shows up and he says, what's going on with you right now? And she tells him, she pours out a story. He said, I want you to do something. You're here and you're feeling like you have so much despair, you have so little hope, you think your life is absolutely over, there is nothing to hold on to, but I hear you, Hagar. I hear you. And there is one thing that you have left that you can do. One thing. What can she do? Sam said, I don't know, I wasn't paying attention. No, like what what can she do? No, I'm... He said, you can comfort your child. Lift up the boy and take him by the hand. That's right. Go back. That's the one thing that you have left. You are still his mother. You can still comfort him. Do the one thing that you have the power to do. No, you don't have any water, but you can go that far, and you can comfort your son. And so she does. The only thing left to her, comforting him. And as she goes, God opened her eyes, and she finds a spring. There's water. If she had stayed there in her despair, if she had not done anything at all, if she had not been able to move at all, she wouldn't have found the spring. She would have died. He would have died. But God said, you do have something you can do. Go do at least that. So she did. Got up, comforted the son, found the spring, and with that experience now of God hearing her as well as seeing her, she's got to remember Uh, from 10 years ago or so when God saw her, he's heard her. Now, all of a sudden, something big shifts inside Hagar because she has been depending upon Abram for so long. Everything that she has is connected to Abram, right? My, My security, my status is me having a child for this man. And all of a sudden that she realizes that that man has let her down. By the way, just like all people will let us down, right? Humans will let you down, no matter how much they love you, no matter how much they say, thank you for having my son, no matter how much. Humans are frail. And they will disappoint you. And all of a sudden, instead of resting everything she has, her worth, her value, how did she know she was valuable? Because of Abram, right? It shifts onto God. Now she knows that she's valuable because God has seen her and God has heard her. That's what gives her worth and value. Not the role she plays in Abram's life. Tangentially, she center stage is important because God sees her and God hears her. And I believe that that's a lesson for us this morning as well. When we think about our value and our worth, you know, think about our kids, you know. Here they are in a family with four siblings, right? Three, so many. three siblings. Well, they have three siblings. You're right. That's good math. Um, you're on fire. You're, you're <laughs> killing it this morning, there, right. Jeremy. Um, Wait, we have another kid I didn't know about? <laughs> <laughs> well, I gave you my handmaid, and then no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's not a new story. <laughs> no, but, like, how do you know that you are the center of attention for anybody? Right. When do you ever feel like the main character, the title, you know, uh, what do you call it in a movie? When you, the, oh, banner, the headliner. The headliner. How do you, we, so rarely we feel that way. So rarely we're looking around and says, well, this is what my friend thinks of me, or this is what Facebook thinks of me, or this is what my boss thinks about me. And there's really a lot of other people that are way more important and get way more likes and shares and, you know, have better salaries, better offices, better houses, right? so easy for us to feel like we are in that one down position and that our worth and our value is connected to more important people around us. But Hagar shows us through her life experience 
that the thing that gives us value and worth is God seeing and God hearing us. Does God see you? Does God hear you? Anyone? You want to say amen? Amen. Yeah, God sees you and hears you. And you are valuable to me, and you are probably valuable to the person sitting next to you this morning, if you have someone sitting next to you this morning. Probably. But you are most important. You are most seen. You are most heard by God in heaven who loves you. That's what Hagar showed us. So she gets water. She comforts her son. She gets water. She, her perspective on her worth and her value changes, and now she has purpose. Now she's able to make a plan. They find a new place to settle. It never says that she finds a husband. The feminist in me loves this. Yay! She stands on right. her own two feet. It says she found her son a wife. She found her son a wife. She knew that that was going to be, and it was an Egyptian wife. Yep. After all those shenanigans with Abram's family, she's like, we're going back home. <laughs> right? Yep. Yeah, she found it because she figured out, or God showed her, where her value comes from. Yes. Love the story about Hagar. I, well, can you come up with another character, female character named Speaks to God, foreigner? It sounds like Ruth a little bit to you. Ruth is a foreigner. Her. Hannah isn't one. Right. Um, Mary's not, no. but there are hardly any Let's women. say this is one of two examples in the Bible that's like this. Yeah. Like this. So glad to spend some time with Hagar. It was Sam's idea. He said, do that. I said, this whole section of scripture is rated X, Sam. I don't want to preach on any of it. He says, preach on Hagar, so thank you. There you go. All right. Amen. All right, goodbye, Instagram. Nice to see you. Glad to hi, Savannah. Glad you joined us. Yeah, save it. All right. Uh, update on the sound investment. The order is in. The money has been sent. The, the electronics are coming. They're on their way. And so soon enough, in due time, in God's time, in good time, and also pray, please, for expediency, um, we'll shift over to our new cameras. Amen. Okay. Um, so next we have a time of offering. Uh, that means that those of you who are online, there's a link that will drop in the comments. You can give a one-time gift there. We also appreciate so much those of you here and in the room uh, and uh, online who um, pledge to the church. That has really been a saving grace during this uncertain time. You know, there used to be, I hate that phrase. I'm sorry I just, used, I repent of using that phrase. <laughs> These uncertain times. Now let's get back to precedented times. Pre yes, I would like some precedented times. But I'll just say this, because um, years ago, in a century far, far away, the church income related a lot to how many people were attending on Sunday morning, right? And it's just been such a gift for those of you who give online, for those of you who set up those recurring gifts, because we don't have to be nervous, because people have to stay home, because they're worried about COVID or Delta or whatever. Right. It's, it's all right. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for your faithfulness and your steadiness uh, with your gifts. All right. We have got some announcements. Pull up some prayer requests. Yes. Thank you for sharing your prayer requests, everyone. I am sweating. Huh. Yeah, it's like summer, full on summer here. I saw somebody comment, Dan Kennedy online commented that it's too hot and humid here. So they're in going North to Vermont. Ridge, going up to Vermont. And, and Shirley's up in Maine. She said 75 and it felt very sticky. Yeah. I wonder where it's not humid. Anybody online, tell me if it is not humid where you are and we're going to consider a trip. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so for announcements, um, it connects to one of our celebration and thanks this morning. Oh, good. So I'm going to do my first celebration and thanks, which is to thank the hospitality crew who was here last night. We had uh, George Schofield and Bobby Pierce and Beth Connors, Chuck Helm, you mm -hmm. and me, all who helped to host a really large high school graduation party in this space last night. Um, and so I want to thank everyone from Aldersgate who helped to make the people feel welcome and help clean this place was a chaos about exactly 12 hours ago. And it is beautiful and ship shape. So let's thank the hospitality team. <laughs> and so related to that, um, there is a sign up sheet that is in the link uh, if you're watching on Facebook. Also, it was in the church email this week. I'll send it again. Um, you can sign up if you're able to greet somebody at the building. People have wanted to come back and use the space for parties. 
Um, if you can do that, that's going to help many hands make light work, help yes. clean up at the end. Um, I got to pop all the balloons. Oh my gosh. It was a little bit traumatic, to be very honest. Um, yeah. Oh, is there a balloon? Sometimes we miss one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Sam was like, yay, let's pop balloons. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, yeah. oh. Didn't help Chuck's P PTSD. Oh, well, God. It didn't help my video. <laughs> anyway, yes. But um, one other thing is that this next Sunday will be the first Sunday that we, the first week that we start hosting North Reading Youth Cheer in this space. Um, that means that we're clear that this area of chairs Sunday after church and stack them up and put them in the back of the foyer. So uh, that's another thing that you can say that you'd be willing to help with. Uh, we'll be doing that for about 13 weeks, 13 Sundays, all the way through the fall. So if you're here, we appreciate that starting next week. All right. Another celebration and thanks this morning is for Sue Preventure. Sue is the one who sends all the cards from the church. If you've gotten a birthday card, an anniversary card, Sent sympathy cards. Sympathy. Sue is on fire. Sue said, I would like to send more cards. Can I send cards to people with prayer requests on occasion? I said, yes, absolutely. Sue said, I love sending cards so much. Now I'm sending cards to my whole family as well, even if they aren't at all. She's it's just, this is her, this is how you know yeah. about calling and vocation. Sue is called into this ministry. Sue, we appreciate you very much. Uh, thank you. Okay. All right, we've got some prayer requests. I just noted them here, but they're on the air. All right. Very good. And then I'm going to go get back in the air conditioning. How all does right. that sound? We were outside all yesterday afternoon. Our band had a gig. It was, like, lovely. It was near a pool. It should have been very nice. I was like, can I just go home and get in my air conditioning? Like, this is fun and all, but I'd like to sit on my sofa. Yeah. In dry air. Okay. Let's be in a spirit of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the wonderful stories from Scripture, God, that we can spend some time just listening and, and learning and considering in our hearts these characters of faith. God, we connect to them, though they're so ancient. Their story is so human, and their story of faith is so relatable. And so we thank you in particular today for the story of Hagar, and we thank you for seeing and hearing us even, God, when we feel like we lack power and status and position, God, you have us as the, the focus and the center of your gaze. That is so humbling. It's amazing. Thank you for Hagar's story. God, we have, as a community, many concerns uh, before us this morning. We always begin by praying for those who are struggling with or in recovery from addiction and for those with mental illness, depression, and anxiety. God, we ask that you would preserve life, that you would bring healing and wholeness. If we're the ones struggling, God, give us hope. And if we're nearby someone who struggles, give us grace, honesty, and patience. God, we pray for Michael Boucher's parents, in particular his mother who has been in the hospital. We pray for both Barbara and Daniel Schinnebarger to heal. We continue in prayer for Marie LaRose's friend, Marie Patrice, in hospice. God, we pray for Kathleen's friend, whose five-year-old daughter, Shaylee, is fighting leukemia for a second time. We pray for Lana Davies' brother and sister-in-law who continue to fight health issues and the stress that this places on their family and on Lana. We pray for one of our family members, Bill Watt, my uncle, uh, for his health and for his wife caring for him. God, we ask that you would help Jan Wise mend from a broken ankle. Lord, we pray for Robin Wilson's family, uh, just prayers of support as they go through a difficult time. And um, we pray for uh, Kathleen Epstein's friend who is having a hard time dealing with dialysis. God, at the same time, there's always joys among us and around us, God. Thank you for helping us to have eyes of faith to see them, to see the blessings. We thank you for increased vaccinations in this country and ask that you would continue to help fight this uh, Delta variant through the wisdom of leadership and scientists and doctors. God, we thank you that Kathleen Epstein received a successful skin graft and is healing after being in rehab for two months. We thank you that Albert Staples has been able to spend time with his family more than he has recently in the last month. Uh, we celebrate safe travels for the Tanners as they head down to visit Alex at Camp Lejeune. 
Uh, we, as th along with Bonnie Spicer, are thankful for the love, support, and smiles from friends and family and Betty and Bob Sweet, her parents, celebrating 62 years of marriage today. God, thank you for that marriage. We pray with Carolyn uh, Costantino for a safe trip home today and ask prayers for Dante's health. And God, finally this morning, we thank you for the life of Joe Connors, Camille Connors' husband who passed away last Sunday. Bring Camille and her family comfort, God, as they mourn his passing after a struggle with cancer. God, thank you for uh, being our faith and uh, giving us faith, and thank you for strengthening that faith. Thank you for helping us to be witnesses to those around us about the blessing of faith in the life that we have. God, please hear us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All righty. Well, it's been lovely. You know, you would think that sitting up in the front doing the talking would be tiring, but this time encourages me and builds me up, too. It's wonderful to see your smiling faces in the room, your nodding heads, and to see the comments coming in through social media. I love this time. Amen. Different than it used to be. Very different. But still lovely. All right, well, God bless you all. Thank you for tuning in, and uh, we'll send it back over to Daniel for a final song. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. Oh, yes, Lord. Sometimes I'm almost to the crown. Oh, Nobody 